Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. ASU physicist Lawrence Krauss visits the Arizona Horizon set each month to give us an update on science news. And tonight, in a half hour special, Dr. Krauss will talk about climate change, the climate change debate, such as it is, and the Higgs boson particle, such as it may be. Here now is. Dr. Lawrence Krauss, always good to see you. It's great to be back. All right, so uh, let's get it going. We got a lot to talk about yeah, here. Yeah, um, a lot of science. This Higgs boson. First of all, am I saying this right? Is yeah. it boson? Boson. Boson. Like bison, but boson. Bo but I don't say bison. Okay, well there you go. Then just say boson. Uh, how about the Higgs? <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll call it the Higgs. <laughs> the Higgs. That's a good well, idea. What is a Higgs? What is a boson? <laughs> oh gosh. Okay. Well, there we go for the half hour. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Quickly, please. <laughs> Well, uh, you, you know, this big discovery in July, which we've actually talked about, that this particle that appears to be related to this a remarkable field that we think exists around the whole universe, which causes particles to have mass. That's an accident of our existence. There's this background field throughout space we postulated, and as particles go through it, like, like swimmers in molasses, they get slowed down, and some particles interact more strongly and act heavier. And some particles interact less strongly and act lighter. And some particles, like light, doesn't interact at all and acts massive. So at a basic level, all of the mass we see in this room is, a, is kind of an accident of our existence. And it sounded so remarkable that many people, including myself, thought it was a little too slimy to be true. But the, but the, the, the thing about, that, about physics is that if you, you can create that field that you can't see, but if you slap it hard enough, physics, quantum mechanics tells us that if you slap it hard enough at a single point, you'll produce particles. And that's what the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva is doing. It's basically slapping empty space hard enough to produce the particles that we thought might ex must exist if the Higgs exists, the Higgs fields exists, and those particles have been discovered. Now, when I say those particles have been discovered, particles that we think may be the Higgs have been discovered, and we, it, there's now enough data, and there was a new report. The original discovery came out in July, and just in Kyoto a few weeks ago, they announced five times more data, and there's now much more definitive evidence that the particle is really there. But they haven't yet been able to sort of take the fingerprint of it, if you wish, to prove it's a Higgs particle. Why can't they do this? Is it that decays in like an instant? Is that the well, idea? It, well, it's not just that it decays in like an instant. It's a, they're looking, I think they, in, in July they had 80 events, but there are more than a million collisions occurring a, each second at the Large Hadron Collider, each of which produces up to a few thousand particles, 10 terabytes of data a million times a second, more data each second than is, exists in all the libraries in, in the entire world. And so to sift through that and try and find the few events that you're looking for is remarkable. It's much harder than finding a needle in a haystack. Is there any scientific reason why it would be so difficult to find? The other stuff's easy to find. It's like, it's like your lawn. I mean, weeds grow easy, but it's hard to grow a lawn. Well, I think the reason it's hard is that if it, if it hadn't been hard, we would have discovered it already. I think the point, the point is that the Higgs particle is very heavy, at least we speculate. Well, we know it is because if it had been lighter, we would have seen it. So you need a lot of energy in a very small region, and we haven't had that much energy. 25 years ago, we proposed building an accelerator in Texas, the superconducting super collider, which would have d discovered the Higgs. In fact, it was better tuned to discover the Higgs because it was being made from scratch. But Congress, in their infinite wisdom, decided to cancel it and after spending two or three billion dollars. And the Large Hadron Collider is kind of a compromise because you see the tunnel already existed in Geneva. It's a 26 kilometer wide tunnel that goes underneath between France and Switzerland. And and they couldn't make a bigger tunnel, and that constrained what they could do. And we were a little worried that it might not have enough energy uh, to detect the Higgs. But remarkably, it seems to have. But it's a very, very difficult thing to do because you've, you've got to take protons and accelerate them at 99.99999% the speed of light in this direction and in that direction and focus them in, in a region smaller than a millionth of an inch in order that they, you get enough collisions. It's a, it's, it is... As I've often said, it, as far as technology is concerned, it's like the Gothic cathedrals of the 21st century because it takes literally thousands of people, decades of time to build this, coming from dozens of countries speaking tens of languages, and it all works. It's kind of amazing. So, again, more data coming in. It looks like, but we're not still sure. But Yeah, but it's scary. It's, uh, and Why the reason is it scary? Is, it's scary for us physicists because it's looking a little too good. It's looking just like 
the simplest model we could have presented for, for what the Higgs should be. But most of us have thought that accompanying the Higgs is a lot of other stuff that would explain the other things we don't understand about nature, why the weak interaction is, is much stronger than gravity. And, and, and we've, we've, over these last 30 years of thinking about it without data, because we've been waiting, right. we've been kind of like locked in sensory deprivation tanks, so we've been hallucinating. But all these interesting theories, supersymmetry, string theory, extra dimensions, all these th ideas have come up. And we had hoped that to understand not just that the Higgs exists, but why it exists where it does, that there'd be a lot of other stuff that would tell us which direction we should be working at to try and understand everything from, from the, unifying, the unification of the three known forces to maybe quantum gravity. We've been waiting for this direction to tell us where to go, and now, if we just, it's the nightmare scenario, as we call it, because if it's just the Higgs and nothing else, Sure, it'll tell us this idea about the origin of mass is correct, but it won't tell us, it won't answer those fundamental questions that, are, that have been really bugging us for, for 25 years. And, and if we don't know which direction to go, it's going to be hard to determine what, how the next machine should be built. So basically, if, if this becomes a simple uh, answer to some kind of standard model of physics. Standard order, model of particle physics. If it but does that, then what happens to string theory? It still waits out there waiting for some more evidence? Well, it, or any evidence, not some more evidence, but any evidence. So, you know, the, kind of, the funny thing is, we always hope we're wrong more than we hope we're right in some sense. And we, the standard model explains every bit of data that's ever been presented in some sense, for the most part, in particle physics. Expect except maybe for a little, these masses of the, these weird particles called neutrinos, and we can get there if we want. But basically, it's the most successful model we've ever built. But there are fundamental que questions at the basis of it. Why? Why does it have the form we have? And how are the forces we, we measure related to each other, and how are they related to gravity? These are the fundamental questions if we really under, want to understand not just the fundamental structure of matter, but the origin of the universe. And, and we need guidance from experiment. And if we just confirm the standard model and don't tell us what's beyond the standard model because we know there must be something beyond it because because the standard model is sort of ugly on its own we really want to we really want to know why it has this form it has and uh, and in particular there's a huge difference between the strength of the known forces in nature as we measure them and we kind of want to understand that difference and we really hoped that associate there's a lot of ideas that tell us associated with the Higgs should be new Symmetries of nature, that means there's a host of new particles. In particular, the best example is something called supersymmetry, which says for every particle we measure in nature, there actually should be another particle we haven't yet seen. Um, uh, particles called fermions should have partners called bosons. That's uh, yeah, yeah. And, and this, it, it's a beautiful mathematical framework, but there's no evidence for it yet. And, and this and, doesn't help matters. Anymore. Well, we thought right around the corner, and we always say that, right around the corner, <laughs> we're going to see that. But there was really good reasons for thinking, because in fact, if these new particles existed, they could be the dark matter that's dominating masses of galaxies, which you've also talked about. They're the best candidate for the dark matter that dominates the, the mass of everything in the universe, 10 times more dark matter than visible matter. So it would have all hung together, and yet we haven't yet seen supersymmetry, and it's a little bit, it's beginning to be embarrassing if the... Large Hadron Collider sees the Higgs and nothing else. Now, it's not precluded yet, but many of us hope that by now there'd be evidence for something new beyond the Higgs. Which we, the Higgs is something we've been waiting for for 50 years, and I don't want to play it down, but we really wanted to see something yes. else to tell us what direction we go in. Because unless we're pointed by experiment, we go off in all directions at once, and it becomes almost metaphysics. Well, it, I was going to say, it's going to become chaos out there if this does prove, like you say, it's, it seems to indicate, and everyone's got, I could start my own theory. Well, you could start your own theory, yeah, exactly. And, uh, and, uh, and at some level, anything goes, and, and it uh, will have to be much more clever to think of observational waves to pro, pro, probe fundamental physics. Now, I have no doubt we will do that, but... But in a, in a way, it would the easy route, the low-hanging fruit would have been nice. If yeah. Fallen off. And, you, and you mentioned uh, how some t scientists often like being wrong because it opens up other avenues. Talk about uncertainty, and you've talked about this before, uncertainty in science. A couple of quotes here. The power of science is uncertainty, and scientists are happy when they get it wrong. That's you saying that stuff. Well, really? Me. Well, I guess I have to stand by. Yeah. No, the, the point is, some people think when we, and it will be relevant when we talk about climate change, actually, in a bit, because... Some people say, well, you know, uncertainty is a bad thing, but it's actually, in science, a good thing. Because in science, unlike pretty well any other area of human activity, 
we can quantify our uncertainty. So we can say, we predict this at a 95% confidence level or at a 99% confidence level. That means 99 out of 100 times we're likely to be right. And that's important because if we know, if, once we quantify our uncertainties, it, tell us, it tells us in a real way how well we understand nature. And in fact, all, everything's uncertain because if you measure the length of this table with a ruler, you'll get, it will be, you know, you'll get it pretty close, but each time you do it, because your eye might move a little bit, you'll get a little bit of change in the measurement. And so we can never, in fact, the difference between numbers in, in physics and numbers in mathematics is the numbers we, that come from measurement always have a measurement error. And we need to know that accurately what the error in the measurement is and the error in our predictions are to see if our theories are right. So the very fact that we can quantify our uncertainty makes it much more powerful than if we made a statement and didn't know at what level we were right or wrong, as often happens in politics or other areas of human sure. activity. So the real power of science is being able to quantify that uncertainty because it means we know what we're talking about. And more important, it means we know when we don't know what we're talking about, which is probably more important. Now, getting it wrong is equally interesting, of course, because, because uh, in science, nature continues to surprise us. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's more exciting when we get it wrong because it means there's more work to do. And we only know if we get it wrong or if we get it right if we can quantify the uncertainty in our measurements and our predictions because otherwise it's just guessing. You know, it, I'll give you an example. Many times people claim, um, it, for example, in medicine, on the basis of one or two cases, that something's true. But on the basis of one or two cases, you don't know your uncertainty. And if you make an, a false claim that leads people to give up taking vaccinations, for example, you're doing real harm. And so whenever people listen to scientists talk and listen to claims, they should ask, how confident are you, you of your claim? And just saying very confident isn't good enough. Scientists can quantify that confidence. And for example, the Higgs boson wasn't claimed to be observed until there was something called a five sigma uncertainty that, that it wouldn't be wrong. That means it had, we had a confidence of 99.99999% accuracy yes. that, that we weren't making a mistake. The, the, the five sigma golden rule in particle physics is you don't claim a discovery till you've seen it at what's called five sigma. That's very conservative compared to the rest of the world. But, you know, quantifying that uncertainty is a key part of science. Well, let's get into global warming because okay. talk about uncertainty. There are a lot of folks out there who see there still being a debate regarding global warming, regarding uh, man's influence on global. We just had a Financial Times op-ed piece with 125 plus uh, scientists, quote unquote, well, yeah, quote unquote, who said that the global warming does not exist because for the past 17, 16 years, the Earth has not warmed. Well, that's the, for, it's complete nonsense. First of all, the scientists weren't climate scientists. They weren't the scientists who actually studied. In fact, they weren't. Many of them weren't scientists. They just had science degrees. And the important thing to realize is a PhD is just a PhD. Uh, you can get PhDs that will say the Earth is flat. I could get 50 PhD scientists around the world to say the Earth is flat. Would that be a controversy? The, the, you know, people have to be skeptical, and they should be skeptical when they see uh, op-eds like that. What are these people? What are their expertise? And what's the data? And their data if the, is nonsense. We have just, there are three bits of, of, of data that have just come out. First of all, global climate change is happening. It's not, it's not some weird prediction of the future. It's already started to happen. And the evidence that, it's hu that humans have been contributing a significant fraction of that is unambiguous. And it's getting even scarier. We have just entered October, the, last, the month before last, was the 332nd consecutive warmest mo month uh, for global temperatures in history. 332, cons if, you're, if you're 27 years old, you've never lived in a month which is colder than average. Mm. Okay, and that, I mean, that, that alone is telling you the Earth is warming up. But in fact, we can measure it in other ways. Another study, an independent study that just came out, is telling us something very scary, that the ice sheets unambiguously in Greenland and Antarctica are melting. Melting at a rate that it accounts, in fact, as you would expect from global warming, for a rise in sea levels. Rise in sea levels isn't fiction, it's happening. About a half an inch in the last uh, 15 or 20 years or so. A half an inch may not seem like a lot, but it could be the precursor of much worse, and indeed, the predictions of climate models that say 
human industrial activity, which produces, it's, it's physics. You see, it isn't just, it isn't liberal or conservative, it's physics. You put more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and you are going to trap more of the sun's heat. And you can make a prediction about what that's going to do to the climate, and the predictions suggest that, in fact, they're very conservative, that, but they suggest that the ice sheet in Greenland may be melting. And for a while, they, they said, well, Antarctica might be melting too, but there wasn't, there, was unambigu there wasn't unambiguous data. But we now see even Antarctica, where we predict the melting should be lower, is actually melting. And that's the other thing about global climate change. It doesn't mean it's happening the same everywhere. In Northern Europe, it, it'll, we predict it'll get colder, okay? So, so climate scientists have compl complex models that have changed a lot in the last 20 years, and their predictions are being vindicated. And this melting in Greenland is very, is, is a great concern because it's nonlinear. If they, it, because once it starts to melt, uh, if, if the melting water goes down below the ice sheets, it can take the whole ice sheet out to the ocean. And this stuff can be nonlinear. We've seen throughout history, if you measure ocean levels over the last 500,000 years at the same time at carbon dioxide levels, that the oceans have changed in, in depth and in and, and, and height, more importantly, by plus or minus 80 meters. 80 meters. And that, uh, that's... Um, but for those who say this has happened in the past, this is, the, this is a, a cyclical change, uh, again, these scientists and whoever they are, uh, they say that they have data that in the last 16 years, they're saying that there is... And, of course, the critics say they're cherry-picking the 16... It's like basically saying your, your, the Earth is 25, whatever, miles long yeah. or 17 yeah. feet long, whatever you want to choose. No, it, it, exactly. If you... If you, if you, if you that we were talking about the age of the Earth. If you say the Earth is 6,000 years old, as some people do, including some people in our, in our state legislature and Senator Marco Rubio recently, what's ridiculous about that, what's ridiculous about, we, we'll come back to climate change, but we, we, we made the segue. What's, you might say, well, why can't we teach kids that the, you know, some people like to believe because the Bible says that the Earth is 6,000 years old. The point is the Earth isn't 6,000 years old. And if, if you think that the Bible insists the earth saying that, you better re-examine the Bible. Because it is such a humongous error. We know the earth is four and a half billion years old. And teaching kids that, well, you can think it's 6,000 years old, or you can think it's four and a half billion years old, is like telling kids when we're doing geography, you can decide that the distance from New York to Los Angeles is 2,500 miles or 17 feet. You decide. And 17 feet is so ludicrous at 6,000 years old is embarrassing. It's embarrassing. We know human civilizations that have been around for more than 6,000 years old. We have, we have relics that are older than 6,000 years old, much less the evidence of the Earth being 4.5 billion years old. But with climate change, it's not, and it's, so there's this invented controversy about the age of the Earth, which, for which there's no controversy. And this global warming has been an invented controversy. A lot of money has been spent convincing people there's a controversy. But these 125 scientists are, you know, we, we had a... Uh, a similar because you can get you can get people who don't believe in evolution to have campaigns where they have a few quote unquote scientists that write. Mm -hmm. So we had a letter, we had a campaign with a T-shirt with 500 scientists named Steve believe in evolution because I mean 125 scientists is nothing. There are 2,000 scientists working on the International Panel on Climate Change, people who do this for a living, and they're not paid to prove. That there's human cli they're they're paid to try and figure out how it works. A couple of NASA astronauts, ex NASA astronauts, well, they say global warming doesn't exist. Well, you know, I, I would hate to say that some of the other things that ex NASA astronauts have said. NASA astronauts are NASA astronauts. They're not climate scientists. And the the point is, it isn't he said she said. The data is unambiguous. 332 consecutive warming months. The uh, the ice sheets melting faster than they've ever melted before. And, in fact, as I say, a half an inch, and it's accelerating, and, and this is happening over decades. You know, there, there are certainly, if you look at history, global variations in climate over centuries and millennia, but this is happening over decades on a time scale that's exactly the same as the exponential growth in our production of carbon dioxide. And the thing that's even scarier is another result that just came out, which I find the most sobering that in spite of all of the talk about the potential dangers of climate change and Hurricane Sandy and flooding in, 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 in low-lying areas, 2011 was the record year for production of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And it looks like 2012 will even be higher. And if you look at the models, and here's a, let's talk about uncertainty. The climate models say we really need to keep the 
temperature rise in the Earth to less than 3.6 degrees, if, unless we want unbelievable ocean level rising and storms. And, and so that should be a target. That was a target you know, we, we tried to make. Well, because we keep adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, and it takes hundreds of years for that to go away, it's cumulative. So had we started to cut our carbon dioxide production if you, due to you know, fossil fuel burning, had we started to cut it in 2011, we would have had to cut about 3% per year to get to the goal of the Earth only warming by 3.6 degrees. If we wait till 2015, we have to cut it by 5%. If we wait till 2020, we have to cut it by 10%, and that's not going to happen. Speaking about fiscal cliffs, we're on the edge of a climate cliff. If we are basically almost over the edge, it is almost unavoidable that the Earth will heat up at a level that's never, that really hasn't happened in the last 500,000 years. And man can, cannot adapt or, or find a way to fix this problem? Well, or are we just I mean, we, it looks mired. like we may have to adapt, but adapting means living a very different life. I mean, adapting for us means dealing with potentially much stronger hurricanes in, and, and, and extremely rare events happening more often, building seawalls around New York or, or giving up New Orleans, but it's even worse because, again, the climate model suggests that in some sense the worst effects will be near the equator. Well, near the equator are where most of the world's population, especially poor population, exist. There's going to be huge amounts of land mass that are removed. Devastation. When you, when you have two billion people you're displacing, if you don't expect socio-political consequences of that, mm. there are problems. And the point is, let's say you can say, and, and, and I, what I wanted to say is, we can say this with a 70% with a likelihood, okay, that we need to cut by these levels by 2020 to have a 70% likelihood. That's based your uncertainty on, on this one. That's the uncertainty, that the climate will only raise by 3.6 degrees. And you might say, oh, 70%. But when you think of the possible problems, the fact that, the oceans have increased not by plus or minus inches, but by 80 meters with even less variation of carbon dioxide. You've got to say, can we afford to ignore this? We may have to figure out ways to, in fact, we're going to have uh, a, a, a big symposium with a public event on climate change in February at ASU as part of the Origins Project that I direct. February 2nd, uh, uh, Saturday night, come, we're going to have some of the world's experts. And we're going to talk about if it's too late. Maybe how can we develop technologies that might try and remove carbon right. dioxide? And is it possible? And if it isn't possible, we may have to adapt. We've only got a couple of minutes left. We need to adapt here because we're running out of time. Well, there we uh, go. But last time we talked, we thought maybe I heard a report that Curiosity up there on Mars had found, perhaps had found something exciting, and uh, you kind of poo-pooed it, and uh, the poo-poo. Yeah, yeah, I was very, one of those cases where I was correct, only because my sources told me not to get too excited. We really hoped that they might discover methane. On, on, on Mars, um, because methane is a gas that's produced by biological organisms, but it doesn't last long in the atmosphere. And so it, it dissipates. So if you found methane in the atmosphere of Mars now, it would suggest not just that life once existed, but that life Does exist. might still exist right now. There might be cows on Mars, not really cows on Mars, but, but uh, methane producing microbes on Mars. And so it would have been a huge result. And of course, it hasn't happened. Does that? So, so we just have to keep waiting. Curiosity. It would have been a big surprise had they discovered, to me at least, if life was still extant on Mars. I, I will be amazed if we don't find evidence of fossilized life, but I'll be still surprised if, this, if life is existing right now. But this curiosity, this thing's working pretty well, isn't it, so it's far? It's amazing. And that's the other thing. You know, it's going to be existing with a, a nuclear generator for 10 years alone on the surface. It's the reason why I keep saying, you want to do good science on Mars, send robots. Don't send people. Because, you know, they don't, they don't need conversation. They don't get happy. They don't they get sad. They don't, they don't feel bad being alone. Yeah. It's just going to wander lonely along the surface of Mars for 10 years. And I find it, it just inspires me. Every morning when I wake up, and I look at a picture, and I think there's curiosity taking pictures for me and doing what, what I couldn't do. All right, Lawrence. Uh, thank you for all this thought now. You got me, my, my mind's spinning, so I've got to wait okay. another month now to figure that out before okay. we get you back on set. Good. Well, thanks a lot. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening.